All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome Gabor Huls, who is in Budapest in Hungary. How are you doing, Gabor? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, no, it's, uh, we're delighted. And, and I think I'm pretty sure you were the first person from Hungary. So and the first person from Budapest. So that's perfect. I love the first as we uh, move around the world. And Gabor is an intercultural leadership consulting coach, author, speaker who's served over 100 clients plus in 30 plus countries and an expat since the age of four, China based since 2002. And what we're going to talk about today is a why a post-pandemic world needs east-west leaders more than ever so um i guess let's we'll, we'll dive straight in uh in gabor um when you say east-west leaders just just kind of explain explain your thesis to me uh, to begin with Right. I mean, east-west leadership and east-west leaders, it basically goes back to the kind of work I do. I arrived in China in 2002. I was a junior diplomat back then. I worked for international organizations and I basically transferred those skills to leadership consulting and I started working for multinational companies. Now, in the early 2000s in China, I mean, uh, those of you who know China now wouldn't recognize it then, but it was it was in the very early phase of international engagement only one year into the WTO membership of China. So typically, I worked with Western leaders in China and the Asia Pacific. You have to imagine somebody from, mm. uh, from Europe or the United States or North America, anywhere, by a Dutch or an American or German multinational company delegated to Japan or Philippines or China. So this is how it's my, my how do you say, my history with East West sure. leaders started. But that's, that's when an interesting thing started happening because as the years went by, I started supporting, coaching, advising um, local Asian leaders who were promoted to a certain leadership position in the multinational companies that originally came from the West. So they are also East-West leaders, but just the other way around, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so when you when you were first doing this work, um, what were you what were you helping? Number one, how are you helping the Western leaders adapt to the you know adapt to the East and also the Eastern, as you said, the the, the local folks who were coming in adapt to the Western style, but without losing the strengths of their own backgrounds. Right. So what we what we want to know about uh, cultural mistakes that we uh, invariably make when we start working, start working with another culture is that we don't recognize about 90 percent of the mistakes we do or mm -hmm. uh, the mistakes that, like, let's say, this kind of typical errors that we stumble into. So we offended somebody or we, we touched upon a raw nerve, but we just simply don't know it. And then we just go on and then we are surprised that the trust or the uh, starting negotiation is not there. And then what first what I help these leaders do is build awareness about the typical mistakes that they are bound to make when they are, let's mm -hmm. say, negotiating with each other or they are running a company together. And then when we have the basic awareness, then we can move on to this kind of skills that can, how you say, that we can use to, to balance out or even to prevent these mistakes and eventually build these new methodologies into a habit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So one of the very, very simple examples is when you stay silent and when you talk, there are certain individuals and there are certain cultures as well, is when, when the, uh, the situation, the conversation becomes a little bit awkward, then mm -hmm. some cultures feel that kind of awkward silence with, with words. So you basically feel obligated to say something. And then they find it soothing, at least the conversation goes on. But there are other kind of cultures when the conversation is awkward, then they then they deliberately pause. And then they they feel that the silence is the one that is soothing because everybody can start thinking about what they are sure. saying. And these two cultures can combine and clash in in, in very amusing, but in business mm -hmm. quite unhelpful ways. Right, right. So, um, so when when you first when you first started doing this, I mean, that's a good example. When you first started doing this, though, what what were some of the other barriers that you saw to 
as I said, for both sides, for both the, the Western folks and the, the locals? Well, I start with building awareness because very often we don't realize how exotic our own culture can be. I don't know if you have ever mm. seen this, this kind of book illustration when they, when they say, you know, when you, uh, when you negotiate with Asian people, then they kind of communicate in a roundabout squigglish way, whereas mm -hmm. Westerners communicate in a straight line. That's because the book was written by somebody who is a Westerner. Right. But otherwise, everybody considers their own culture normal and the other one uh, squigglish, so to speak. Mm -hmm. so for example, one of the things that I like calling attention to is when you are a boss and most of the people that I work with, they are high level managers. Sure. How many cultural traditions are packed into the relationship between boss and employee? And when you go to another culture, then a completely different role is given to you and completely different reactions are expected from you if you lead people from a completely different culture. So who is the boss? Is the boss just a member in the team? Is the boss a parent? Is the commander right. a guru and, and a visionary? So these are the kind of things that I like calling first. Right. And, uh, and, and I guess that, that that's a very fascinating one is that the, the awareness piece, because we tend to, as you said, um, you know, we tend, tend to be that aware of our own culture and how that expresses itself and, and how, that, uh, how that impacts on other people. Um, so I guess, obviously, in, in the early days, especially, as you said, uh, and maybe people from the West are maybe a little bit less conscious of, of their own culture because they just, you know, it's been around, they assume it and they feel that they're, you know, um, modern industrialized West. So maybe the cultural, um, the cultural things that we carry with us, maybe we're not as aware of them as maybe perhaps other people are. Well, nobody can explain their own culture. That is, that is a universal rule. And also when, um, we have a, an international business situation, even if we have it online, some people are in that cultural comfort zones and some are not. So this is one of the reasons why I think that we need intercultural leaders now more than ever, because everybody is, is, is good. We are slowly opening it. Also, we are hoping that we can do a lot of the intercultural business online. And very often we think, um, online business is, is kind of, um, culture free or in a yeah. way it's, it's culture sterile. So you have mm -hmm. to get on a plane and get off and each strange food expose yourself to exotic web. But I very often tell the leaders it's the other way around. When you visit another country and you can, you can, uh, see the city through a taxi ride, at least mm -hmm. you mentally and emotionally yourself to negotiate across cultures. But if you hop from one MS team calls to another one within two hours, then nothing prepares you to calibrate yourself to the cultural needs of the other side. And the misunderstandings can be even more severe than face to face. That's a fantastic point. Um, well, I hadn't thought of that before, but yeah, I mean, I guess when you're online, you really do think that it is um, kind of a culturally neutral space when it clearly, clearly isn't. And, um, have you seen that? Has that become, is that kind of more of an issue? Because as you said, I mean, if you do travel to another country, you tend to get yourself somewhat mentally prepared and all, and all of that. Uh, so how do you avoid this situation in online engagement? Because I could just, I could see how you could fall into that trap very easily of thinking it's a culturally neutral space. Hmm. Well, I meant the situation about, okay, let's, let's get it this way. There are certain mm -hmm. European cultures, uh, good examples would be, uh, the culture of France culture to some extent, the United Kingdom, but uh, specific, for example, Ireland would be a good example. Eastern Europe would be a good example where I come from, where people are uh, like proactive communication. They like to take the floor. They like to express themselves in a fairly straightforward way. And there are cultures all over the world which are more about the go with the flow and, and keep the harmony kind of culture. So we know that certain Asian cultures in Japan, in Thailand, uh, they follow this culture code, but even in Europe, for example, Nordic countries, they are much less confrontational than the ones that I mentioned mm -hmm. right now. So if usually it's the, uh, is the, is the, is the more go with the flow culture that falls silent because, uh, they have something confrontational in their head, but they don't want to say it outright. Mm -hmm. 
but then at least you can read their body and you can look around and you can kind of feel that they are uncomfortable. And if you are a straightforward, proactive communicator, you can reach out and say, well, I feel a problem with what I just said. What would it be? Now imagine the same kind of communication online and imagine, mm -hmm. for example, I, um, I work online with uh, companies like high technology firms, chip making firms, research labs for uh, pharmaceutical companies. They are not allowed to have a camera for confidentiality reasons. Now mm -hmm. imagine there is total silence. Yeah. There is dead air on the call. What do you do with that without body language? Sometimes without even knowing those people in person, because now we have been doing mm -hmm. this for more than two years, mm -hmm. not only other clients and suppliers we haven't met uh, in person, uh, the C-suit uh, executives that I work with, they have employees they never met in person. Yeah. So it's then when you have to deal with it in a completely different way. You have to translate the concept of body language in what you can hear. Mm -hmm. You have to come up with some very, very good questions to probe until the conversation can be restarted. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's another interesting point there because, as you said, is like um, you could easily, especially in an online, you could easily just kind of bulldoze ahead and and end up in uh, in in not a great situation. Uh, so it really, it really, it really behoves the person to be pro, as you said, to be proactive and aware. And realize that uh, you know there are different ways of approaching things. So you do have to modify. You do have to make sure that the other people are are in are are being engaged, um, which is obviously a, which is obviously you know quite the challenge in some respects. Well, on one, true, but on the other hand, I, I always remind the people that I work with that if you if a, you participate in an in a in a cross cultural intercultural training course mm -hmm. whose primary objective is to reduce friction to reduce conflict then obviously you must engage the other in order to reduce conflict but in business we have to go beyond that because the ultimate goal of uh, uh, improving your intercultural skills is not to reduce conflict but to get uh, the, uh, the job done so basically to reach the business you are supposed to reach now if you jump in if you're proactive if you're a little bit pushy, might be right. You uh, see, you're smart, you tour, but what you want to get done is not going to get done. Because if the other mm. side doesn't have the initiative, if they are not engaged, then it sounds like you convinced them, but actually, then you are going to part. They are going back to their own bus uh, business. You are going back to yours, and you are waiting for them to, I don't know, to act up on the commitment to fulfill the promise. And they are not going to do so, and you are not going to know what the problem is. <laughs> So the problem is that um, in different cultures, and I'm using air quotes, professional behavior sure. is defined in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And this is what we must bridge. So for example, proactive extroverted communicators, they have a strong responsibility to make the other side communicate, especially with agreement, because we have to know exactly mm -hmm. what the disagreement is and how to overcome it. Yeah. And even even agreement, because let's face it, in some cultures saying yes doesn't, you know, in some cultures, yes means yes. In some cultures, yes is, is more polite than it doesn't actually mean yes. And that's something that you have to you have to learn all of these things. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in every culture, yes is yes. It's just the function of the word. Yes, is different. In some cultures, mm -hmm. yes means I hear you. I'm thinking yeah. in other cultures, yeah. it means, OK, this is done. Let's move on to the next topic. So the problem is not with, with does yes mean yes. Um, it is a little bit like, imagine it like temperature. Um, let's say <clears throat> when you say it's cold today, it means something completely different in uh, Singapore than Norway. Both people sure. say cold, though both of them mean what the word cold is. You know, I, um, temperature yeah. is relatively low and it influences me. It's just uh, the situation is completely different. And this is what... Um, Business decision makers have to not understand the other side. That's not enough, but learn what mm -hmm. motivates them and how you can put the right button so that they do what you expect them to do. I always say it's a little bit like playing badminton in the wind. You know, you still want the ball mm -hmm. to go there straight ahead, <laughs> but you don't, 
don't hit it straight ahead because yes. the way. No, absolutely. So um, if you're going to be a successful kind of East-West leader, um, do you do you need to spend significant time? I mean, do you need to live in the culture, you know, to spend your time living in the different cultures for a while to spend time? Or can you can you do this? Um, I mean, could you do this even remotely? You can. So the interesting thing about what we do, and not only myself, but all the intercultural mm -hmm. uh, coaches and trainers and so on, is that we classify cultures. Basically, um, you could describe a culture. Just just let me put it this way. Um, if you want to explain uh, how you are supposed to act professionally in Germany to somebody who has never mm -hmm. been in Germany, then you can say something like, just imagine that in Germany, most people think like engineers, lawyers, pharmacists. So basically, they want to reduce the risk of mistake because they think mistakes mm -hmm. have an uh, enormous cost. And they are mm -hmm. trying to be very precise in order to reduce the mistakes. But you can also imagine that let's say people in, in many Middle Eastern countries or in the Philippines or in Mexico, they have more like the heart of an entertainer. Um, nice. And then you can go on and on and on. So you want to describe a fairly tough competitive culture, a little bit uh, like, like France or like Israel, then you could say those people think like salespeople or like politicians. Um, and once you classify cultures, you don't necessarily have to I don't know that much about the history of that country, for mm -hmm. example, or the, or the folk traditions of that country. All you need to know is which behavioral elements they have more of, let's say, confrontation, uh, service mentality, uh, extroversion, meaning wanting attention and, and uh, not stopping until you get it, precision, mm -hmm. uh, risk taking, and so on. And then it becomes almost like a geometric exercise. Now, then you put the country to it, and then you say, how is China different from, let's say, the United States of America? Well, we have to be extremely careful with that because there are several and surprisingly diverse cultures within uh -huh. each country, especially the big ones. Sure. Mm -hmm. One of the big mistakes is that, um, statistically speaking, culture, uh, China is really a country where most people follow values such as obedience, social harmony. But most foreigners, over 90% of foreigners who ever work in China, they work in places like Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Beijing, who have a fairly confrontational subculture without a non, uh, within a non-confrontational country. Mm -hmm. So then again, if you want to prepare people for working in those cities, then they're not going to get too far with the mainstream Chinese culture. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. And it is something... Um... I mean, when I first came here to the to the States, uh, you know, first working and living here, you know, I learned that because as I went to people say Americans and you go, well, what do you mean by that? Because exactly. an American from New York, an American from here in San Diego, an American from Michigan, you know, they can be very, very different. And and as you said, doing business, you do business very differently in maybe some of the southern states than you would in the other ones, more relationship uh pressing the flesh, like chatting, learning about stuff. New York, it's like, get to the point. Come on. Exactly. And and the brilliance of some of the methods is that you can map these cultures. You can map the differences between these cultures. So you could you could even map the differences uh, between, let's say, Boston and Houston in uh, the mm -hmm. United States. You can map the difference between Beijing and Shenzhen in China. And you can also map the compatibility of individual people with any of these cultures, you could even map professional cultures. Let's say, how do salespeople think differently from their engineers right. when you want to m turn an engineer into a salesperson or you want to promote a salesperson into leading an engineering team? Let's say they become COO. And then finally, very important is the corporate culture that we are dealing with. So it's not enough to, to say, let's say, sure. there is this Western leader. This Western leader works for a car company in Shenzhen. Okay, we know the Western leader's behavior profile. We know the profile of China and Shenzhen. Which car company? Because if they work for Tesla, BMW, or Peugeot, it's going to be a completely different story. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's that that's that's fascinating. Like then the different layers that you can 
that you can go down in order to you know make sure that you get you get the match exactly right and i do think and because we live in such a world of like superficiality and generalizations that i think it's it's really important that we understand you know that culture has layers to it you know there's there's a lot of layers to it and especially and within the within countries and cultures itself there's layers mm. to it as well that's how human beings work so we label each other because it it is uh, easier to label each other it's a little bit like uh, just imagine that you are uh, inviting some people to your house and then somebody says xyz just say a name is coming this afternoon so you don't have a concept of that person you say so who is this guy he says oh, he's a doctor immediately you, right. you make a couple of value judgments what kind of per person he can be it's like hey, really a doctor um could i know him no no he's from iran whoops then a complete mm. about face when it comes to the value judgment. And this is exactly how we work interculturally as well. If you are about to meet somebody, if you if you find out that this person is going to be your boss, or if you are going on a on a Zoom call with somebody, you are you are constantly rewriting and rewriting these labels that you have mm. about the other person. And basically, when we work with leaders, then we we teach them, we advise them to start from the inside with their own behavior profile right because that, mm -hmm. that's the biggest distortion in the in the equation that extroverted and tough and competitive people judge similarly competitive people much more positively than go with the flow kind of people so first mm -hmm. we build awareness about the leader's own behavior profile and then we step out and then we say how about your team how about your department how about your company how about the countries involved but by that time they have developed a certain familiarity between not these individual cultures, but the classification of cultures. Right. So they will find it much easier to add the behavioral elements that are needed to be productive across these cultures. Yeah. It's always interesting that it, uh, everything kind of comes back to self-awareness at the end of the day. It doesn't matter you know, what it is. It always comes back to you have to start with being aware of yourself and build upon that, whether it's in a situation like this or, or many other ones. It's self-awareness is the key component. It is because um, at the beginning of the conversation, you cannot know the other person. I mean, mm -hmm. we are all locked inside our own head. And in order to know the other person a little bit better, we have to, I'm sorry for the word, but I, we have to shut up and then we have to sharpen our senses to what they say, yeah. the way they behave, to what they are not saying, the way they relate to us. And then that's when the information starts coming. But we have to put our ego aside and we have to look at what that person wants from us and what mm -hmm. motivates them. And if I want something from that person, which I usually do in business, it yeah. can be a supplier, it can be a client, it can be my boss, it can be my team member. I want that person to perform in a certain way. So then I have to basically fulfill certain needs in the other person. What motivates yeah. them? What triggers them? So that's why we have to quiet down a little bit, put our own, um, how do you say, the way we want the world to look like to the side and yeah. put ourselves into the shoes of the other person. And you're you're perfectly right. At the end of the day, it's 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 grandmother's wisdom. I mean, this is something, mm -hmm. but this is not the only time when we have to use um, grandmother's wisdom in business. It's yeah, just that yeah. we're busy, we are under pressure, and we simply forget to focus on the other person. Yeah, no, you know, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, your point about uh, um, shutting up and keeping quiet and listening, it's a it's a good one because, again, it's uh, we live in a world where everybody is so distracted. Everybody wants to talk. Everybody wants to po. Everybody wants to be, you know, getting their opinion out that it's it's becoming a lost art in many ways. Um, well, listen, uh, Gabor, this has been fantastic. Like all of Gabor's information is going to be below this video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about the work you do. Yeah, so the way you have to imagine is I spend most of my time with mid managers and up, so up to the C suits, uh, vice presidents, and so on. Most of the time with with um, corporate people, sometimes academics, diplomats, and so on. I sit down with them and I find out where they get lost in translation, and we go through these awareness, then skills, then habits sequence until that uh, roadblock has gone away. And then in my upcoming book that I mentioned to you before, yeah. uh, called Dragon Suit, 
I um, basically summarize lots of these conversations, you know, sometimes for confidentiality reasons, I cannot say who sure. is the one on the other side, but sometimes I can. Surprisingly, many of these uh, C-suite leaders gave their consent to uh, publish the interviews together with their names. And then basically um, people who are listening to us or people who are reading the book, they can live through the journey of being tossed into a very exotic culture and taking the very tough challenge of a multinational company says, listen, we are going to ship you over to another con continent where people speak another language. The mm -hmm. weather is different. Food is different. The social interactions are different. But you have to just log in and keep doing the same work from the next day onwards. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely tough. And that's sure. when I must support people because, you know, they do get stuck. They do get desperate. They do have ideas, but they have a little bit of an imposter syndrome. They don't know if it's realistic. <laughs> they don't want to share it with their families, with their bosses, with their teams, because they, they don't want to lose their dignity, basically. <laughs> and people like me, they, we, we talk it through with them. And uh, we, we act as a second opinion, sometimes a, a, a shoulder to cry on. But ultimately, we come up with constructive and systematic replicable ways to work mm. across cultures that are very far away from each other. Yeah, fantastic. Listen, I love the work you're doing. I think it's so it's so critical. The more we can help people understand each other, we're big believers that trade is is uh, is the greatest driver of peace and prosperity. So the more people can understand each other across cultures, the more they can trade, indulge in common, fair trade and equal commerce that, you know, we the world will be a better place the more we understand each other. So listen, then. Um, Yes, go ahead. Absolutely. And especially now that politics kind of up the ante and creates a little bit of yeah. friction. I think I think uh, commercial relations are the ones that keep flowing and keep binding us together. Yes, absolutely. Well, listen, thanks again, Gabor. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.